in the last uh, lecture we looked at Napoleon and his relationship to Europe, the conquests, the reorganizations and the reform. We also try to note the possible impact of the reform on the future histories of the conquered regions. In this uh, last lecture on Napoleon, we trace the road to decline, his final defeat at Waterloo and banishment to the island of St. Helena. And we would also like to very briefly look at his impact on this entire period of French as well as European history. After 1808, Napoleon appeared to take all sorts of questionable decisions, both on the military and the political fronts. We have seen that by 1807, Napoleon stood at the zenith of his power and had virtually subjugated or had been had, had brought all the European powers into a subordinate alliance except for one power and that was Britain. Britain proved to be Napoleon's and France's state first enemy from the early 1790s. Napoleon had made a temporary truce at Amiens in 1802 and had experienced the shattering defeat in the naval battle of Trafalgar. Napoleon decided to bring what he described as the nation of shopkeepers onto their knees by adopting an economic form of warfare. This is what is known as the continental blockade. Napoleon promulgated the Berlin Decree in November 1806 when he entered Berlin after defeating Prussia in the Battle of Jena. In this, he simply declared that the British Isles are in a state of blockade. The idea was to shut off the continental markets to British industrial products. It is important to note at this point that the British industrialization had virtually taken off, to quote uh, Rosto, between 1780s and the early 1800s. So in a way, Britain was the first country that had experienced the Industrial Revolution. Napoleon's idea was to stop both the colonial re-export commodities that Britain brought from the colonies and re-exported to the continent as well as the British industrial products. By affecting their trade, Napoleon hoped to uh, produce a glut in production and thus drain away Britain's gold reserve. This he felt was the surest way of attacking or indeed of uh, bringing uh, Britain down on its knees. He meant to conquer the sea by land as he said not a direct warfare, but an economic warfare. Now, as an economic weapon, it was probably not very wrong in its conception, but we shall see a whole lot of problems scraped in when Napoleon tried to enforce it. The Berlin Decree was followed by Milan Decree, and much later came the Fontainebleau, then the Trianon and Saint-Cloud Decrees uh, between 1806 and 1810-11. Now, when Napoleon announced this, uh, Britain responded by uh, issuing orders in council. They said that any ship uh, obeying the Berlin decree would be uh, considered as an enemy ship. In order to avoid this, what was essential was to take out a permit from Britain. The problem was simpler for Britain in the sense that she had not only industrial superiority, but she had superiority of the seas as well. She could cut off France's connection with the colonial uh, world, France's own colonial world, uh, rather than France really uh, forcing the issue on Britain so far as the high seas were concerned. But Napoleon's basic idea was not a colonial warfare, but to simply shut the continental market to England. In the initial period, this had not been a failure. By 1808, British exports had certainly gone down. 
in the first half of uh, first quarter, shall we say, of 1808, <coughs> British exports went down uh, in total value from 9,000 sterling pound to about 7,000 sterling pound. In the next quarter, it went down even farther from more than 10,500 sterling pound to about 7,000 sterling pound again. Now, this would have affected Britain adversely. Again, this was a moment when Napoleon took a questionable decision, that of intervening in Spain. And this, at a level, let Britain off a hook, something Napoleon was to repeat again in 1810-11. As Napoleon continued with the continental system and was trying to make it more stringent, there was a possibility that France might also substitute Britain as a supplier of the continent. Here, however, there was a problem because France was not yet an industrialized country. Therefore, French industry was not quite equipped or large to really replace Britain as a supplier of Europe. As a result, when British commodities uh, were not reaching the continental markets, the people felt the pinch of it. Napoleonic argument was that Europe must unite and suffer temporary deprivation did not cut any ice with the people because they found hardly anything to choose between a British domination or a French domination. Indeed, gradually even the French merchants were suffering because they had invested large amount of money as advance for commodities which they were not getting. But what really upset Napoleon was the gradual emergence of a very large network of smuggling. It was a vast European coastline which Napoleon would have found it very difficult to cut off. He did not have the naval strength. Portugal was in very close alliance with Britain and it virtually acted as a subsidiary economy of England. So goods would come to Portugal, through Spain it could reach Europe. It would go down, uh, come to the Italian coast, Adriatic and otherwise, and then from there through land route or river Rhine route would reach the interior of uh, Europe. It would also be, uh, uh, be coming through the North Sea or the Baltic region. So it was difficult or if not impossible to cut off the vast European coastline. Uh, how would Napoleon tackle with the smuggling? One reason why Napoleon intervened in Spain was that he needed to go to Portugal. He could not take the sea route, therefore he had to go to Portugal through Spain. It is later in the uh, uh, Trianon and Sacrud decrees, Napoleon ordered the public burning of uh, contraband goods. This indeed produced a great deal of discontent in the European uh, uh, cities. Uh, and other areas of Europe and particularly uh, there were great popular unrest in parts of Germany uh, a, a, as, a, as, a, as a result of the stringent um, uh, orders which were introduced to enforce the continental blockade. Historians have suggested, Marshall Dunan for example, that the continental blockade was simply a blockade, an attempt to cut off uh, European market from British commodities. But it was later enlarged into what he calls the continental system. The system was uh, more comprehensive. It actually sought to use the entire European economy, economy of the conquered and unconquered areas as subservient to French economy. And this is where Napoleon failed miserably. He could neither control smuggling. Indeed, later he was obliged to relax it by introducing a license system. You know, as one historian has said that Napoleon, in order to avoid smuggling, assumed the role of the smuggler himself. He even was obliged to import British books for his army. And in 1810-11, when Britain was really suffering, again, that was another peak when British exports had gone down. 
Napoleon saved them by an export of wheat of which there was an abundant production in France. So, there were loopholes, uh, logical inconsistencies in the way the uh, continental blockade and the continental system as it later became was being applied or implemented in Europe and ultimately it acted more as a boomerang than as a real target. Britain did suffer. There were uh, uh, gluts in production, uh, goods could not be sold, they were being dumped in the warehouses, uh, the industries uh, were experiencing recession and there was social disturbance, particularly the famous Luddite movement. People did not understand the economic hardship and attributed to it to the new machines which had come up. So, the Luddite movement tried destroying the machines themselves. In 1808, Napoleon intervened in Spain. In 1812, he intervened in Moscow. So, the continental blockade was the beginning of the end. Then came the Peninsular War. In 1808, he intervened in Spain. I have already said that he needed to enter Spain in order to go to Portugal. But when he perceived there was a possibility of change of government in, in Spain, instead of supporting Ferdinand, who was a, would have been a popular choice instead of Charles VIII, the Bourbon king of Spain, Napoleon intrigued with Godoy, the unpopular but powerful minister, by promising him a principality in southern Portugal, summoned Ferdinand to meet him at Bayen and decided when Charles abdicated, decided to place his brother Joseph on the throne of Spain. Joseph was brought, brought from Naples to Spain and Mura was made the king of Naples. Now, this proved to be a disastrous decision. Napoleon came to Spain and was involved in a war that dragged on for four years ending finally in his defeat. As early as July 1808, Napoleon was defeated at Belen, his forces I mean were defeated at Belen by the Spaniards. This created a tremendous uh, impact on, on Europe that this powerful grand army could be defeated after all. Napoleon experienced logistical difficulties in, in Spain. His earlier military tactic was not working because the Spaniards uh, receded and resorted to what has since been uh, come to be since come to be called as the guerrilla form of warfare. The peasants were involved, the army was involved, the clergy were involved. Napoleon derisively called it an insurrection of the monks. It is true, Spain was a Catholic country and they equated Napoleon with the revolution and the attack on the church. But at another level, it was a resistance that involved the entire people of Spain almost. And there are contemporary evidence to suggest that it was a popular resistance indeed. Napoleon failed to get the enemy in open battle. He did make some headway in the beginning, but he failed to cross the whole of Spain and reach Portugal for Portugal had been reinforced by British assistance. And finally, after four years, which made all difference because its demand of huge resources in terms of men and money, Napoleon was defeated in the battles of Salamanca and Vitoria in 1813 and was obliged to withdraw from Spain. By then, it was too late. The Spanish war, the Peninsular War, has indeed been uh, called the Spanish ulcer by historians. It, it destroyed Napoleon. There is no doubt that this is where Napoleon experienced a different kind of a war which did not suit his strategy. It was a multinational war now, multinational uh, army even. The Grand Army now had Poles, Italians, Germans, Moggers, people from all over the conquered parts of the Grand Empire. And I, I mentioned in the last class uh, how an Italian poet referred to this situation, how unsavory, how tragic it is for an Italian to die in Spain for Napoleon. 
Now, Napoleon had so long financed his wars by the resources he collected from within the conquered areas. Spain made all the difference between receiving and spending. Here, Napoleon had to bring money from France. He was around 1810 for the first time forced to impose new taxes in order to raise resources to continue with his wars and that was a tragedy. Again in 1811 or 1812 before the Spanish war was brought to a close, when the Spanish war was demanding a lot of men and money, Napoleon made fresh spate of war in 19. 1809-10 and again in 1811. He defeated Austria, married the Austrian princess by divorcing his long-time wife Josephine. You know, it was legitimacy he was looking for. By marrying into royalty, Napoleon would like to get rid of his usurper status and consider himself as part of the dynastic principle of the principle of legitimacy. The French Revolution was primarily against this principle of legitimacy and this is why Napoleon was now trying to hide in order to satisfy his megalomania. In 1812, even before the Spanish war had been brought to an end, Napoleon decided on a campaign of Moscow. The Tsar Alexander had virtually broken out of the continental system or the blockade. Because the Russian merchants were jittery. They had lost a whole lot of money. They wanted war trade to be resumed with Britain. The Tsar was afraid that the nobles and the merchants might pressurize him into a difficult situation. Napoleon decided to teach the Russians a lesson, got together a massive army of 600,000 and made his march, the famous march to Moscow. He went through the North European terrain, tried to give battle, but the Russians re retreated. They were following what was known as the scorched earth policy. They destroyed everything as they re retreated so that Napoleon's army was denied the resources. Basic reason of Napoleon's success so far in, in, in military things had been his speed. Now Napoleon was obliged to have a huge baggage train to keep this huge army supplied. He got the army at Borodino. There was a, a skirmish. There was heavy loss on either side. But Kutuzov, the Russian general, succeeded in retreating not only to Moscow but beyond. By the time Napoleon reached Moscow, winter had set in, but he found nobody in Moscow. Kutuzov had retreated beyond Moscow, the Tsar was away in St. Petersburg and the whole of Moscow was burning. One gets graphic description of this in Tolstoy's War and Peace. Napoleon waited in vain. The whole campaign, which cost him so much in terms of loss of human lives and money, resulted in a big zero, perhaps a big negative. Napoleon started his withdrawal. By that time, winter had set in. And as has been said, the Russia's two best generals were January and February. <clears throat> Napoleon lost a good part of his army for want of food coming through this uh, more than knee deep snow in many places. And they were pursued, they were attacked by the Cossack brigades. There was some kind of a popular uprising as well. By the time Napoleon returned at the end in 1813, he had only one third of this huge grand army left. Napoleon knew he had committed a mistake, but he felt he would have time to rectify them. At the same time, he had to withdraw from Spain. Spain was lost, so was Portugal. And from Portugal, Wellington, the Duke of Wellington, could now come via Spain and attack Spain, uh, France from the southern side. Napoleon felt he could still recover his grounds. He did mention it to his aides. I have made a mistake. 
but I know I have ways of rectifying them. He again got together an army and at what cost? Conscription was re reaching absurd proportions. After 1811, it was not uncommon to see people in the countryside, young people with festering wounds. They had inflicted wounds on themselves and going around simply to avoid being conscripted for Napoleon's army. Napoleon nevertheless got together an army of about 300,000 and decided to march on Europe again. He would go as far as Germany. And it is, it is here that he was to now confront an aroused people in Germany. The German battles had been called uh, one battle at least as the Battle of Nations. There was a feeling of the other that I mentioned earlier that Napoleon was now seen as something that did not mean good for the Germans as it did not for the Italians. Jerome from Westphalia was reporting of unrest. Holland of Louis had indeed very clearly indicated dissent about the continental blockade. Louis was ousted and Holland was incorporated into France. Napoleon was moving, but now he had the Austrian uh, ruler as his relative. He had married the Austrian princess. So Prince Metternich, who was the foreign minister and the chancellor of Austria, proposed Napoleon terms of peace. He was to be dissuaded from making further war and Napoleon would be allowed to preserve some of his conquests even, but he must accept peace and not make war anymore. I think the tragedy of Napoleon is summed up in what he told Metternich, and I must quote from him, I would die before I ceded one inch of territory. Your sovereigns born on the throne can be beaten 20 times and still return to their capitals. I cannot do that because I am an abstract soldier. My domination will not be able to survive from the day I cease to be strong and consequently to be feared." Unquote. This was an absurd situation. He must make war continuously to prove that he was strong. He must prove that he was strong to be feared and Obviously, this was an untenable, unsustainable situation for a very long period of time. Napoleon knew how to make war, but he did not know how to bring it to an end, how to make peace. And thus, his moment of destiny came very soon. Before the Battle of Leipzig in October, he was seen by a, a, one of his generals as reciting from Voltaire. I am quoting again. I have served, commanded, conquered 40 years. Of the world in my hands, I have seen the fortunes, and I have always known that on every occasion, the destiny of states depends on a single moment." Unquote. Napoleon's moment of destiny had arrived at Leipzig. This was known as the Battle of Nations. A combination of forces brought Napoleon down. Napoleon was defeated in Leipzig. By the time the uh, truce, peace of, uh, uh, or the Treaty of Reichenbach had brought Russia, Prussia, and Austria together, by early 1814, the Treaty of Chaumont would bring Britain into the coalition, the fourth coalition that would defeat Napoleon ultimately. Napoleon returned from Europe almost for the last time. And in 1814, started the invasion of France. Austrians, Russians, Prussians, and Duke of Wellington from Spain would converge on Paris. By April, Napoleon's dismissal had been intimated by the bourgeoisie, which had invented him as a savior. The Allies in a manifesto said that they are not making war on France. They are inside French territory to not make war on France or the French. They said they were simply trying to eliminate the domination of Napoleon. 
which Napoleon had wrongly imposed on Europe for a long time. They even said that France would be allowed to retain its natural frontiers, which meant France could retain its 1792 frontiers. It did not go back to 1789. The bourgeoisie took hint of this uh, implication and they dismissed Napoleon. Talera was made the head of a provisional government and Talera now mooted the principle of legitimacy to bring the brother of Louis XVI back to the throne of France. Napoleon was banished to Elba, but he returned. After nine months, Napoleon returned, which has been described as the flight of the eagle. He returned for a hundred days. Napoleon returned and when he was moving towards Paris, he was confronted by a group of soldiers. Napoleon faced them and told them, I have come back, I am your emperor. You can kill me if you want or you can follow me if you want. Napoleon's charismatic uh, charm and appeal was still there. The crowd shouted, vive l'empereur, long live the emperor. Napoleon marched to Paris and was preparing for the final battle, which came in June at Waterloo in Belgium. It's a battle of Waterloo with which the name of the Duke of Wellington is uh, associated. Napoleon was defeated. And Napoleon was now banished to St. Helena, where he died six years later at the age of 53 only. As Frederick Masséna in his Napoleon Inconnu has said, in a disordered imagination lies the source of human unhappiness. It makes us wander across the seas from one fantasy to another. And if its spell leaves us in the end, it is by then too late. The hour strikes and the man dies detesting life. This is a very interesting observation on the man. But let us end by assessing Napoleon. In his exile at St. Helena, Napoleon took in a way a revenge on his victors. In his memoirs, Napoleon painted a picture of himself as the savior of France, as a protector of liberty. He made himself much of what he was not. But the point that we must make following Lefebvre and Tular and many other historians, that Napoleon was part of the French Revolution. That Napoleon grew from the revolution and one cannot understand him without the revolution. His tenure was not, as Bergeron says, a mere episode in French history. It was intrinsic to the entire quarter century that we have tried to read for such a long time. Mm -hmm.